funding source for that. Um, and you know, hopefully that doesn't happen. But if, uh, as the board report hopefully explained, the non-recoverable fund um, has, is subject to um, wide swings from year to year. And the reason we're in this situation is that uh, a couple of fiscal years ago, we had some very significant losses that were not were unplanned, obviously. Um, whereas the recoverable internal service fund is more predictable from year to year. So if we do have an unanticipated significant loss, um, I'll have to come back to the board to find a funding source uh, for that loss. Thank you. Anything you care to add, Mr. Woods? I see you unmuted yourself, so I don't want to. Yeah, I was just the opportunity. <laughs> well, I was just going to I was just going to add that. Um, these are uninsurable events, and uh, when we have major losses, uh, they do manifest into direct impacts to discretionary revenue. Um, because of our budget uh, constraints this year, if you'll recall, we uh, weren't able to fund the general liability non-recoverable to its full actuarial amount. Uh, in the future years, we'll be looking at that with County Council and the Risk Management Division to make sure that we can fund as much as we can, but uh, it does have an impact to operations. And uh, while this year it's not impacting operations, I just want to be aware that, you know, it could have impacts in future years to operations to be able to fund the non-recoverable mm -hmm. section. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's see if I have any public comment on 29. Seeing nobody in the room and no hands up via the Zoom, we'll head into item 19, Supervisor Parker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to just uh, see if, um, this is an item that uh, maybe could be pulled and uh, trailed until we can hear from uh, Dr. Gray. This, these are, this is the creation of a couple of positions at Natividad and um, they, they look important, they're high level, um, but uh, I, and it's probably a function that because of uh, the pandemic, we haven't had as regular uh, performance um, evaluations and so on, but before we do a chief of ambulatory services, I'd like to hear um, how the uh, clinic integration is going. I mean, it makes sense to me that you might need that, um, but I, I really, before we create uh, two positions outside of the budget process, um, I'd like to be more familiar with how this fits into the, you know, into the plan. So um, uh, I'm hoping that it, there may be a, a couple of weeks um, uh, timeline flexibility that we could actually um, sit down with Dr. Gray maybe and, and learn more about how this fits um, rather than uh, taking this on today. Well, I'm going to turn to our CAO, Mr. McKee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Parker, for raising the issues. I think. Um, uh, uh, we could have Dr. Gray come back maybe at a future meeting to uh, discuss more in depth these two positions. Uh, I know that the chief medical information officer is, is one that uh, there's been some, um, uh, there have been some times over the years where, where they've used uh, uh, some staff over there. I think Dr. Harris has been pretty uh, heavily involved in that to, uh, and this, that position this, uh, would be something that uh, the action would be formalizing that that position, uh, and then the the ambulatory care position uh, is one that I think is also uh, you know probably uh, important to as you said some of the some of the uh, clinic issues I see uh, the uh, human resources uh, um, uh, uh, chief for Natividad uh, Janine Boyer is here, so I don't know if she would be able to talk about any of these at all. Uh, it's item 19 on the agenda, the creation of the two new positions. Janine, are you able to talk about that? It might be, it still might be good to have a comprehensive um, uh, report brought back. I know in, 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 I think Supervisor Parker is looking at, uh, you know, how it fits into the overall uh, uh, business plan of Natividad, especially as we're, as we're talking about some of the changes that might happen in the near future on, on clinics and clinic integration. Um, I don't know. Hello. I don't know if I can ask the board if it's possible to, um, I understand Doc, um, Supervisor Parker's question as it relates to the clinic infrastructure and ambulatory care and the clinics. Um, would it be possible as Dr. Um, sorry, as um, 
Mr. Makia said CMIO is a critical position to the overall hospital um, as it relates to the hospital as a whole, not necessarily to the clinics. Um, would it be possible at all to possibly look at separating these and approving CMIO to go forward and pulling out the ambulatory um, chief medical officer so that Dr. Gray would be able to be in attendance to answer those questions as it relates to the integration? I'm a little bit familiar, but I don't want to speak out of turn since he is not present. Um, but as um, we continue to move forward and push the hospital um, to um, move forward as it relates to its infrastructure and information technology. The chief medical information officer is critical to that as they um, help oversee the clinical side of our IT structure, um, whereas our other CMIO is really relates to infrastructure and the um, network inside of the facil uh, facility. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a possibility to um, separate those and approve one today. Um, I, I I'm sympathetic to the idea. I just, I guess if it's so important, I don't know why it didn't come as part of the budget process and creating these high level positions. I, I just have a concern, you know, in terms of long-term sustainability. So I, I, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to nitpick. I just am trying to understand uh, how this fits into the larger um, picture. And um, I'm, I'm just uncomfortable making this kind of commitment kind of out of the blue. Um, and as I say, I think it may be a function that we just haven't had as much contact with um, Dr. Gray as, as we uh, usually do. Um, but I, I just think that if we can wait um, a couple of weeks and really get the information we need, I'd feel a lot more comfortable before we start creating. I just, anyway, there are just some concerns there that are not necessarily so, it's not fully about, only about the content or the function of the position. It's also the overall organization and, and direction. And I want to be sure we're, you know, we're on the right track. So, um, Thank you. I'm going to go to Supervisor Phillips next. Supervisor Phillips. Yeah, I, I, I share a little bit, uh, 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 Supervisor, uh, uh, concern. Uh, and uh, uh, I know my office called to try to get more information, especially when this is coming uh, after the budget process. I, I, I would like to get a little more information, too. OK. Any other uh, input from supervisors? Okay, seeing none, I'll see if we have any public comment on this item. All right, so that wraps up our consent. So at this point, we can entertain a motion with changes to 19, if if so desired. Supervisor Parker, I see you're unmuted. I, I'll go ahead and move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of 19 and ask that that come back to us um, in the near future. Second. I have a motion from Parker, a second from Phillips. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Alejo. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. Aye. Supervisor Parker. Aye. Supervisor Adams. Aye. And Chair Supervisor Lopez. Aye. Thank you. The consent carries with an exception of 19, which moves uh, down the road for us. We'll bring that back as soon as possible with the requested information. And with that, we're going to head into our ceremonial resolutions, which are items three and four on today's agenda. And I'll go ahead and see if we have any public comment on the ceremonial resolutions. Seeing none in uh, room and none via the Zoom, I will go ahead and bring it back to uh, the board for action. Move to approve the ceremonial resolutions. Second. Got a motion from Adams, a second from Parker. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Alejo. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. Aye. Supervisor Parker. Aye. Supervisor Adams. Aye. And Chair Supervisor Lopez. Aye. The motion carries unanimously, and we're going to turn the floor over to Nikki Fowler from the Environmental Health Department uh, to give us some comments about number three. 
Thank you very much, Chairman Lopez. Good morning. My name, uh, also fellow supervisors, good morning. Uh, my name is Nikki Fowler, and I am the supervisor of the Environmental Health Review Services Program within the Health Department's Environmental Health Bureau. Joining me today via Zoom is Matt Krenz. He's a senior environmental health specialist, and momentarily he'll present for you the value of recognizing this week, September 14th through 18th, as Septic Smart Week for Monterey County. Our team in environmental health oversees the siting and installation of on-site wastewater treatment systems. The acronym is OUTS or O-W-T-S, and that's commonly referred to as a septic system. In May of 2018, I had the pleasure of presenting to you Monterey County's Local Agency Management Program, or LAMP, and that's our county's guide to responsible on-site wastewater management that assures protection of groundwater, surface water, and public health. It also complies with statewide regulations for septic systems. Uh, our team has implemented the program for over two years now, and we're currently finalizing a draft amendment to Monterey County Code Chapter 15.20, uh, and that will incorporate the, these standards into our local ordinance. The draft ordinance will soon be posted on our website for public review uh, in the coming weeks. And we'll also intend to hold some stakeholder meetings before returning to this board to present the proposed amendment in early 2021. Uh, pardon my digression as I've taken this opportunity to give you a, a brief insight to our progress on those efforts. Um, but those really have to do with standards for new and replacement septic systems. Um, Matt standing by to highlight for you the importance of caring for this often overlooked but ever important piece of on-site infrastructure. So Matt, if you will. Thanks, Nikki. Um, thank you, Chairman uh, Lopez and Supervisors. My name is Matt Krenz, a Senior Specialist in our Environmental Health Review Services Program. Um, and as Nikki has alluded to, um, yeah, the septic system siting and design is important. However, uh, the existing septic systems in, in our county, uh, very rural counties, so we have many of them. And the EPA, uh, quite some time ago, recognized the value of these, uh, what they call decentralized uh, wastewater treatment systems. Uh, that's the outs that Nikki referred to. Um, they do a great job, um, but what EPA also recognized is uh, the value of maintaining these septic systems. So they've created this week, uh, Septic Smart Week, with the focus of, uh, you know, conveying to homeowners, hey, uh, it's, uh, it's time to maintain your septic systems. If you're not, uh, look into them, uh, get some people out there. You know, it's just like an automobile. You need to maintain it um, or there are uh, issues down the road uh, that could affect groundwater, uh, could affect soil, uh, certainly the enjoyment of property uh, that everyone's entitled to. And uh, we've got many resources. Uh, how do we do the education and outreach? Uh, well, it's actually daily, uh, but with this week, um, we're modifying our website. So we do have a new, a new link on our uh, Environmental Health Review Services webpage uh, under our on-site wastewater treatment system that's for the public. A lot of resources there, uh, real quick, efficient educational uh, videos, uh, you know, little tutorials, uh, anecdotes on the right way to do things and just, you know, prevent that, uh, that, you know, big bill down the road, but, you know, more importantly, you know, protect our groundwater, protect our soil. Um, it, it's, it's limited and uh, we need to do, do our part uh, to be septic smart. So that, that's what this week's all about is to just kind of bring it into light. And, uh, you know, we appreciate you allowing us to uh, speak on the benefits of recognizing uh, this very important septic smart week in Monterey County. Um, and that concludes our presentation and certainly happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Matthew and Nikki. We greatly appreciate you bringing this to our attention as the owner of two septic systems in rural Monterey County. I appreciate all your efforts. I know due to the uh, awareness that you've helped raise uh, during the installation of my last system, we actually opened up our existing system and found root uh, intrusion and made sure to clean all that up and get it pumped out and make sure that the leach lines were operating properly. All that is very important for the environmental health uh, of, of our county and the quality of life that we all enjoy, knowing that long-term those can have impacts on our groundwater and the environment that we all share. So thank you for your efforts. and. Uh, we encourage the public to look into their own septic systems if they've got them and make sure that they're holding up and keeping up. So once again, we appreciate you guys bringing this to the board and helping share awareness. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. 
So with that, we're going to move into our appointments, which are items five through seven. I'll see if I have any public comment on our appointments. See nobody in the room and no hands up via the Zoom. I'll bring it back to the board for conversation or action. Move approval of the appointments. Second. I've got a motion from Supervisor Adams and a second from Supervisor Phillips. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Supervisor Alejo. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. Aye. Supervisor Parker. Aye. Supervisor Adams. Aye. And Chair Supervisor Lopez. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we're going to head into other board matters, uh, which begin with board comments. So I'm going to go ahead and go in reverse order this week. Supervisor Adams. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to uh, let people in the, particularly in the district, know that um, there is going to be a Big Sur multi agency advisory committee meeting on Friday in Big Sur. Well, no, it's not going to be in Big Sur. It's going to be Zoom, as everything is. I keep picturing myself going down there for that. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention is that there had been an item, uh, a scheduled item to be heard uh, at that Bismarck meeting that dealt with a surveillance tower that was being proposed in the Lucia area of Big Sur. And I want anyone listening to be uh, aware that the federal government has withdrawn that project. So that will not be coming before us at all. The project is not going to be happening. Um, also, um, we're going to be having our Carmel Valley Road Advisory Committee uh, on September 24th. It was going to be held this coming Thursday, but we uh, uh, delayed that so that um, there was going to be able, we would be able to participate in the important uh, Coastal Commission hearing on CalAM's proposed desal project this week. And just as a, a, a comment, um, however that project goes, I just really hope that the outcome, after the outcome, we as a community will be able to draw together and start looking at a, um, at a, a, a regional approach to this issue that we have in our county. And then I finally, I wanna thank particularly the sheriff, um, also Gary Malay and all of the folks in OES um, uh, for the uh, successful evacuation that we had with the River Carmel and the Dolan fires uh, in the district. I think this, uh, this, we're almost at the point where it, we will have a really good opportunity to evaluate what went well and what lessons we can learn since we've just gone through such a major drill as a community. I, I think it would be helpful for us to really have a good, uh, a, a good debriefing and an after action report and uh, hope to participate in that as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank Those you, Supervisor. Arts. We're gonna go to Supervisor Parker next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick thing, I wanted to uh, um, let people know that uh, last night at our virtual Hot Topics meeting, uh, the discussion was about uh, rapid testing. We had a couple of doctors uh, from Community Hospital who are very interested in um, the potential for um, inexpensive uh, rapid result uh, testing to be uh, made available to people across the country, in our state, um, in our community. And um, anyway, it was uh, a good discussion, an intriguing idea. Um, I could see from, from it, though, that there will need to be a lot of um, details worked out about um, you know, if we could do rapid tests in our own home or whatever, um, how what's the network, um, what's the way to get communication about COVID positive cases to public health and um, contact, trace and uh, contact tracers. And, you know, there's a whole um, infrastructure involved with, um, with this, but um, just the initial conversation was uh, really sparked people's interests. And um, it's nice to know that there are you know, good ideas uh, coming forward to uh, to track um, and hopefully eventually to prevent the spread of the virus. In addition to all the things that we're already doing that seem to be working, and I know we'll hear more about that this afternoon, but just, um, you know, washing hands, um, only going places that we need to go and wearing our face coverings. So um, thanks to the community for all you're doing to keep yourselves and, and the rest of us safe. And um, I know the conversation will continue about new, new options and new technologies. 
um, that are, you know, at least on the horizon. I don't know how quickly, but um, uh, it's it's just um, hopeful to contemplate. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Parker. We're going to go to Supervisor Phillips next. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, you know, uh, with, with the digital divide, uh, it, it does impact us up here in North Monterey County. And, and recently, my office uh, uh, was instrumental in opening up, um, uh, putting out some tables at the Castro Library. Uh, and we have about four or five kids that come to use the Wi-Fi there at the at the uh, library. And so it's, it's provided some access, but that kind of points out the need for uh, more internet access out here. Uh, uh, we had, uh, uh, I'm part of the North County Affiliate Fund of the Community Foundation, uh, and we just awarded $35,000 in grants to 11 uh, different North County uh, um, uh, nonprofits. And it's kind of a neat thing where all the money goes to North County uh, uh, projects, similar to what you've done down there in South County with the Community Foundation. Um, and 5,000 of that is going to uh, the a school district here in North Monterey County for uh, to help work on the internet access on that. Um, and my family and and uh, uh, we're trying to encourage a lot of the other people uh, in North Monterey County to go out and get takeout orders from the restaurants. Our restaurants are really struggling. Um, and if we don't, uh, we're afraid if we don't keep pushing and, and help support them that uh, our restaurants just aren't going to make it here and uh, some of the smaller ones in North Monterey County. And uh, finally, our thoughts go out to uh, what your uh, uh, people are dealing with down in uh, South County. You seem to get hit with uh, uh, more of the uh, crises than, than the rest of us. So uh, uh, appreciate uh, all you're going through and all the fire departments, uh, what they're doing to keep you safe. So uh, with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor. I'm going to go to Supervisor Alejo next. Supervisor uh, Lopez, can you hear me uh, clearly? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, I'm having a slow connectivity over here. I'm visiting my father again here um, um, in Phoenix. Um, He's doing well, so I'm, I'm glad to spend some time here for a couple of weeks um, helping take care of him. I just wanted to just make some comments um, because uh, we're under a timeline here on the U.S. Census. I have an op-ed coming out in the Salinas, California, urging our residents to uh, take this seriously. Um, we've been through a lot of hardships with this pandemic and these recent fires, uh, the Dolan, that continues to impact our Big Sur and South County residents. Um, so certainly wanted to put our prayers out to those firefighters still um, helping bring that under control. But the question always remains, what could you do to help your community uh, at this time that could have an impact over 10 years, the next decade? And that is filling out the census. Um, we're, we're only at about 64%. Um, uh, Salinas is a, a little bit under that, but uh, we still have time to um, try to get more people counted in these last remaining days. And I really uh, commend my colleagues on the Board of Supervisors for being true leaders in, um, in challenging and standing up to these policies that want to exclude immigrants, put citizenship questions, and now even cutting a month of our count time for our numerators to do the work to count those that still haven't filled out their census forms. Um, but nonetheless, we, unless the court intervenes on extending it and bringing back the original date of the end of October, uh, we would otherwise end the count at the end of September. And that is why I wanna really encourage our residents to um, uh, go to the, go online or, or go to the phone, call, phone and it only, it's only 10 questions, it's confidential. Um, um, and so it only takes a few minutes of your time, but it will bring in uh, significant money. We, we gain $2,000 a year for every person who is counted on the census over a decade. That's $20,000 a person. That is million, hundreds of millions of dollars for Monterey County over, over the next 10 years. So um, just wanted to make that last shout out and ho hopefully all of us encourage on social media any way we can to get more of our, our residents to get up um, and hopefully we get over 70, 80% on these remaining days. Um, on the digital divide, I know we're gonna talk about that on a referral for a few minutes, but I, I did have a chance to uh, go and, and uh, visit Acosta Plaza who's been trying to bring um, internet access at a centralized place for those that don't have it. And uh, HP Enterprises recently donated three bundles um, for schools to um, um, put up these devices um, and so one of them luckily is, is likely to go to at uh, Costa Plaza 
working with our county board of ed. It's a high density neighborhood, as we know, 350 condos there for low income residents, but it's one of those places that would really help the students and families that don't have access to internet during this time to have a centralized place where they could go if, if they have no service at home. So I wanna thank uh, um, our superintendent, Deneen Gus and HP Enterprises for that partnership to make that happen in uh, East Salinas. Um, also, the city, uh, Salinas City Council is voting on this project home key, 101 units to convert a hotel into transitional and permanent supportive housing for our homeless residents in Salinas. I send a letter of support but on these issues that sometimes become controversial, I think this is a time where local governments want to stand with each other, encourage each other to have courage and leadership to um, bring what we know is needed. And that is that transitional and permanent supportive housing that helps people get off the street and into dignified housing with support services so they could be successful and remain um, away from being homeless once again. So that vote is going to happen tonight to enter into negotiations, but we have perhaps the, the opportunity to draw down millions of dollars to bring this uh, important project to Salinas. And I wanna thank our county staff who worked with the city Salinas staff on the application under very expedited timelines uh, to make it happen. And we only, the city will only have till December 20th to uh, negotiate and get in, into that agreement um, to finalize this, uh, this project. So I'm pretty excited about it. It is in my district and I wanna uh, just uh, commend the city council for their leadership because this is what we need during these challenging times to address our homelessness crisis. Last point was tomorrow is September 16th. It's um, it's a uh, would normally be um, a time for celebration of the Mexican Independence Day, and usually we would have had a big um, festival in East Salinas last weekend. Unfortunately, that couldn't happen under our circumstances. But nonetheless, just want to um, uh, pay tribute to all those. Who, uh, who are Mexican American ancestry. In fact, I think several Central American countries have their independence days at the same time. But I just, wa I just wanted to reflect um, and comment on the diversity and the celebrations that happen in our communities here in Monterey County uh, for these independence days um, in September. I think there's a total of eight um, Latin American countries that celebrate their independence day in the month of September. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. I, uh, I quickly just want to echo your comments on census. I was able to participate last week in a town hall with our Senator Ana Caballero as well as our Assembly Member uh, Rivas to share with the community some of the highlights about why they should fill out the census. And one of the participants on that call was a firefighter who lost his home in Kashawa. Uh, and so all the way across the board, it impacts us for a decade. And I think it's important for the community to know that. And we need to continue to share that message all the way up to the deadline. And I'm also supportive of the 101 unit uh, housing project. And I'm glad for the role the county was able to play in helping make that happen. Um, the other, for me, I, I do want to say September has been a long year. And that's not a typo. Uh, this has been a special month, uh, you know, especially with that fire rolling over the hill, rolling towards our community slowly. You know, our hearts went out to Big Sur when it started there, and it continues to push south there. There's still some challenges, but, you know, we've been watching it come towards us. And so with my community now sort of in the sights of this one, we, uh, I, I want to thank them. I want to thank the community for continuing to communicate. I get so many calls every single day, but I appreciate the phone calls because my community is getting clarifying messages and making sure that they have the best information possible through the sheriff, through our Office of Emergency Services. And it's that key communication that keeps us all safe, that keeps us ahead of any danger that might come. It takes partnerships. We've got some incredible ones in South County with the Salinas Valley Fairgrounds who's helped us set up with the SPCA, a place for large animals to go and to do that ahead of time so that everybody can be prepared and make the decisions they need to make based on their own family housing and obviously uh, geographic location. And lastly, I, on that note, I wanna thank the volunteers and the county employees uh, from the Red Cross and the county library system so far who've really stepped up to make sure that our community knows that there's a place for them to go. We encourage our communities to plan when you see a disaster occurring in your region like this one. And we say, have a plan. Well, part of that plan, the first question is, where am I going to go as soon as I leave, right? Where are we meeting? What is that juncture? And right now I know that it's the library in King City. And as soon as we looked at the hours, the, the staff stepped up and said, you know what, we need, we need to go longer. First night they went till 2 a.m. and then they went 24 hours to let the community plan on having a place to go. 
I was able to stop by there on, it was about midnight on Friday, and I stopped in to visit with the volunteers and to thank them for spending their time. That was when I was coming out of the hills and thanking them for all that they were doing just to be that place, that source of comfort for our community. And we know that there's still some long nights ahead as our firefighters and all of our sheriffs continue to do everything they can to keep us safe to battle this blaze. Uh, but knowing that every resource we have is now made available to the community in the proper way is so critically important. So to everybody involved in that effort, uh, from the bottom to the top, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you, and hopefully the year of September is over soon. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the CAO for his comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, you just reiterate, reiterate everything you just said. Uh, it's been been quite a month. Uh, September, obviously, August was a big month too, and uh, uh, hopefully, we can uh, keep these uh, disasters and emergencies at uh, at bay, or at least within uh, reason, so we can address them as they come along. And the thank you that goes out uh, to uh, all the all the people in the community that step up. It, it, it shows um, you know these kinds of emergencies. Uh, uh, can bring out the best in people, and it's really good to see when that happens. Uh, the staff of OES and the library and and others who have who have uh, uh, who have made these things happen is really important. Obviously, the contract purchasing crew, uh, Mike Durr and his team, Gary Malay and his team at OES, they've been phenomenal also. And, and uh, anything we can do, just let us know, and we'll be there. Um, we have we do have uh, one referral this week, and it's a, a joint referral from Supervisors Alejo and Lopez regarding the digital divide. I think you heard Supervisor Alejo uh, uh, speak to it briefly. Uh, the digital divide, is, as uh, most people know in Monterey County, uh, is between the haves and haves not, have nots in many ways, both the uh, resources available to get the devices and then also in the infrastructure where it can be. And, and you, in some of those places, you could have uh, as much money as you want and you still can't get the infrastructure, where in other places uh, we know that uh, income is, is a big uh, issue to being able to get the services. So it's a complex issue, and the referral is asking for uh, uh, collaborative uh, efforts to address the digital divide. Uh, working in partnership with the, with the school district, cities, uh, the county, and I would add in with the state. Obviously, they're, they're a big player in this, at making these things happen, as well as the various um, uh, service providers, both infrastructure and, and, and the individual service providers that are out there. And we're going to have uh, our IT director, our Chatham, lead this, uh, but we also have a legislative component, so we'll have uh, Annette Diadamo from our intergovernment and legislative affairs uh, group uh, partner with uh, uh, Mr. Chatham on how to bring this forward and, and hopefully we can address some of these things. We know the board allocated some money uh, during the CARES Act funding to address some of these uh, digital divide issues and we want to make sure that we leverage that with uh, our partners in the cities and in the state. I'll go to Supervisor Alejo. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, and I uh, for my colleagues, I just wanted to, and our staff, I don't want to say that we, we have an opportunity to really lead here. We know that there's uh, Monterey County recently received a lot of attention with the two little girls trying to access the internet outside a fast food restaurant in East Salinas. But from, from that um, heartbreaking image, we have an opportunity to really lead. Uh, even though we're a local government, I, I, um, we're, not, we're in a position where we could really lead the state as a county and asking our, more from our state leaders, but also taking care of our backyard. We had a, a Zoom call with Supervisor Lopez, CAO um, McKee, um, some staff from the IT with uh, the first meeting ever with our superintendents, City of Salinas and us talking about how we could um, expand uh, um, internet access for all residents in Salinas, but also recognition that from Salinas, we wanna work on doing the same for all the other parts of Monterey County. Um, so part of it is to work on collaboratively to address the issue for the largest city in the Monterey Bay, but also um, um, work with the state um, leaders to hopefully have our county officially propose um, having legislation to put a universal broadband and fiber bond on the future ballot. Um, and so specifically asking and being a sponsor for the legislation. And I've already talked to Assembly members, Miguel Santiago and uh, Eduardo Garcia, who are big champions on this. And there's a, an openness and a willingness to do that next year. But more recently, um, there's an effort to ask the governor to call an extra, extraordinary uh, special session this fall, uh, just on the digital divide. And that is with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who's, who works to try to provide internet access to low-income communities. Um, so that is something that we could bring to our ledge committee and bring to the board 
and actually sending a letter to the governor asking for this session. So we hope there's these other efforts that we could do, including supporting reforms for the state programs that, that regulate um, cable and uh, telephone, but now they should be also regulate internet similarly and, and money that should go to expand internet access in rural areas, but also where there's other needs in the urban areas also. So there's a lot that could come from this, some that don't take too much effort, um, but nonetheless, it would allow us as a board of supervisors to be leaders, the leaders in California on this issue. So I hope that at our next legislative meeting, we could um, um, get some of these approvals, bring them to the board and then get these letters and proposals out to the legislature. Some of these things are moving really fast. And at the federal level, um, we have our lobbyists in, in Washington, but that is also doing work with the FCC uh, to regulate internet again as a utility um, that was uh, th in 2017, the current Trump administration uh, ended that, but that there should be an effort to restore that so that at the federal level, we're also making changes to make it easier for local governments to carry out projects and expand internet coverage in our areas. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Adams. Thank you so much. I, I really just want to give a big thank you to my colleague, Supervisor Alejo and Supervisor Lopez for following through and, and pushing to have this happen. You may recall that at the um, August 18th Board of Supervisors meeting, I made the recommendation that we pursue countywide um, internet access. And I think that without equity and accessibility, our county does not have the opportunity to thrive. So I'm just particularly thankful that, um, that my two colleagues are able to move forward on this. And I'm here to help and support it in any way that I possibly can, because it is key to the success of Monterey County. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. And I briefly want to say, I know the Supervisor Alejo covered who was in that meeting, but he missed one major person at the table with us that day, which was critical. And that was a California PUC, a CPUC commissioner who was sitting at the table with us to have a critical conversation about what our needs are and how we structure success for our community. And another part of the uh, referral that I think the CAO didn't read off, but I want to make sure that we highlight is the very last sentence, which is we are asking that we perform a survey, you know, to do a, do a survey of our community and ask how are families doing during this, specifically what, what challenges are they having so that we know exactly what the need is and where they are as we use zip codes as part of that, hopefully. And we've got some creative ideas on how we're going to get there, but I think all of those help us to solve the problem. Uh, so I think all of this together will help us move forward as a community. And uh, I just want to th thank the board uh, for at least giving us the opportunity to talk about it in this forum. Supervisor Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to um, jump in briefly to say um, part of my concern with the CARE Act, um, CARES Act money was what's our plan? And so I'm really uh, glad that you are bringing this referral forward and that we have an opportunity to to uh, spell out, you know, what's needed, where are the gaps, what what can the county's role be, and how do we advocate um, on the levels where you know we, you know, it's it's not our uh, jurisdiction, but the state or the feds. You know, I just um, really appreciate this because then we can focus our efforts in a much more cohesive way, and um, I always think that's uh, it has the potential for being much more effective. So going beyond uh, good intentions to actually having a plan and mapping it out and then being able to follow it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. I see your hand is up again. Yes, one more point, and I didn't want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing up that uh, the fact that we had a, an actual one of five California PUC commissioners joining our call and providing her thoughts or feedback, ideas of how, uh, plus her support for what is happening here in Monterey County. But she also gave us another insight that, um, and another effort that we will bring as part of this referral, which is that the PUC uh, has a new program rolling out and it is similar to the, the long um, held lifeline program for telephone access for low income families. They are starting a similar program for um, internet service for low income families, but the law makes it contingent on whether uh, internet service providers or ISPs are willing to participate that basically means in, in real world terms that um, uh, AT&T, Charter and Comcast have to be willing to participate in the program to make this um, low income um, 
program, affordable program available to our, our residents. And so th this is another effort that even before the rollout of this program, um, it's an opportunity for Monterey County and hopefully our, our 12 cities to join together and ask all the providers that cover Monterey County that we are urging them, um, 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 demanding that they do participate in this program because it's only gonna benefit our low income residents and again, be a part of the strategy of, of addressing the digital divide in Monterey County. This is around the corner. This is uh, something that is very doable and there should be no reason that any of the companies serving the county shouldn't participate in this program. So another good effort that we could do, act locally, but address a statewide problem. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. At this point, I wanna see if we have any public comment on this referral. Seeing nobody in room, I'll go to the Zoom and I see no hands up. And so we'll go ahead and continue forward and head into our general public comment, which is the time on the agenda where the public has an opportunity to make comments on items not on today's agenda. Uh, you'll be given two minutes to address the board. If you're joining us via Zoom, we ask that you use the raise hand function to be recognized. If you're on a landline, star nine will raise the hand on our end and let us know that you wish to be recognized. So at this point, I'm going to go with Marilyn Galley. Marilyn, you have two minutes to share your public comment with this board. You now have the ability to unmute yourself. Okay, hello? Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Um, my concern is my county. I um, feel that we are being shelter in place, which I call house arrest, because we are not allowed to go back to the way it used to be. I'm not happy with the fact that you approved, the board, the board approved us to have signed Marilyn, you there? We lost your audio. We see you're still connected and your microphone is still clear. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move. killing on me. They're you're cutting in and out, Marilyn. We're going to let you go ahead and try to figure out your the tech on your end. We'll give you another shot. We're going to go to John Martinez next. John, we're going to give you the ability to unmute yourself and go ahead and share your two-minute public comment with this board. Yes, great. Thank you. Uh, it has to do with... Uh, I'm from South County, Gonzales, California, and I'd like to say hi to all of you and thank you for all the great work you're doing. And Luis, I uh, pray for you and your dad there and wish him the best. Uh, um, please get back to me. Please call me if you'd if you uh, like to talk about that. I would appreciate that. Uh, what I'm talking about, what, what I'm going to spend my minute on is real quick. I'm asking that we encourage uh, sanitizing our hands before walking into any facility, such as the courthouse, unemployment office, welfare department, dentist office, hospitals, anywhere. If we can sanitize our hands, it keeps everybody from bringing in the uh, contaminant into the location. That means your car, your taxi, your plane, your train, your boat. Don't let anybody into your facility without first being sanitized. I, it's great to have the sanitation at the cashier, but that's after you do your shopping and you contaminate it half the place. I believe that we can uh, keep the virus outside of our four walls. That means your guys' courthouse. When you come in the back door, there should be a sanitizer. I come in the front door, there should be a sanitizer. And it must be mandatory. If it's mandatory, everybody does it. No mask, no service, no sanitation, no entrance. I believe if we did that, we would uh, fix one of the big problems that brought that to my attention, which is the farm labor uh, uh, crew that we have out in the fields in California. They get onto a bus, no one's asked to sanitize. They're touching everything on the bus. Now imagine that in the MST, everybody gets on the bus. Why can't the bus driver sanitize you before walking into the bus and sitting down? Why can't the ag guys do the same? And then we go on and on and on. You can't walk into a store, into your house, into a taxi 
without getting sanitized by the Uber guy, right? Uh, and it's just my recommendation. I believe it'll work. Fauci says, uh, mask, six feet, wash your hands. Why Thank wash you. your hands? Thank you, John. For sanitation. Your, your two minutes are up. We appreciate your comment. Thank you, John. We're going to go to Marilyn Galley next. Marilyn, see if we figured out the microphone issue. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, we've got you this time. Uh, I don't know what happened. I got kicked out. I'm, I just am concerned that my privacy rights are being exposed by tracking people in the county. That is, tra that is going against my health privacy. And I am, I, I'm not against the virus. I'm not against us keeping clean. I'm not against not supporting our community. I'm against the fact that you're going after me for my privacy and my health, which is between me and my doctor. It has, does, since when does the County Board of Supervisors invading our privacy? I just want our, our county back to normal. I want our, open, I, I want our businesses open fully, not, not just to go get takeout. I support my our, our local restaurants. I go I go and eat there, and I eat outside, and I go by the rules. I wear my mask. But this is going to end. It is already September. I'm, I'm concerned about my neighbors telling on one another. Has anybody know anything about history that is repeating itself right now? That's disappointing to me when my neighbors are telling on me. It's disappointing when they're telling on businesses and they're spying on them if they're not adhering to your protocol. And, and these fines that are mandated by you? I don't wanna have to go for a walk and, and watch out to see if somebody's gonna come up to me and find me $100 or $200 or $500. That's ridiculous. I moved down to this county, I retired here to enjoy the ocean and I can't even go to the ocean. Thank you, Marilyn. Your two minutes are up. We appreciate your public comment. At this point, we're gonna to turn to, uh, it's Alcatel 3B. Uh, we're going to give you the ability to unmute yourself and share a two-minute public comment with this board. Hi, um, I I just had wanted to say something. Um, I've been an employee for the Monterey County Health Department for over ten years, and um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I think it's kind of unfair that. Some of us workers are exempt in regards to that 12 week um, FMLA program that you guys have for some of us who have children that are uh, distance learning. But I requested to be able to use that time because I do have two children that are special needs and I don't have any family to help me with them and they do have IEPs and they do have um, learning disabilities are supposed to have uh, teacher aides, but they can't because they're not in school. So when I requested the 12 week assistance, uh, I was told that I was exempt because we are disaster relief employees, which I understand, you know, that's why I've been coming to work. But when I asked about if they had you know, thought about anything in regards to some of us that aren't married, don't have a spouse, father's not involved, we don't have family, both my parents are passed away. So now I'm like having to make a decision, do I stay home and help my kids and lose my job or do I stay at work and my kids don't get a proper education? So I just want, you know, to know if the board or if maybe in time, you know, in, uh, that you guys can look into that. It's really disappointing, and especially somebody who's put in over 10 years of time, you know, dedicating herself to her job, which I'm not the only one who's in this situation. You know, there's a lot of other employees and we've all been told the same thing. 
So I'm just kind of hoping that, you know, maybe the Board of Supervisors could step in and see what you guys can do for us. You know, it's not like we don't want to work, we're here, but then at, we're at a point where it's not our fault what happened, you know? So we have Thank to look you. out for our children also. So I was just wondering if you guys can look into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your comment. I'm going to see if I have anybody in room. Please come forward. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Cameron. I'm here on behalf of Safe Ag, Safe Schools. It was my understanding that our county ag commissioner was going to come and give a response. Um, I believe he's doing that That's later, later in the agenda. If you're going to comment on the agenda item, could you wait till we get to that item on well, the agenda? Well, I can't possibly because I'm a virtual teacher, so I came here on my lunch break. I need to get back to my class. Is it okay. possible that I comment now? Thank you, thank you sir. Um, I'd just like to address the fact that we need public information. And I believe that's the item we at hand, is the farming near schools safely. In regards to the farming near schools safely item, I believe it's going to be argued that there may be, thank you, there may be uh, cost measures that are argued due to COVID. And uh, one solution we could easily come up with is to ask the county ag commissioner to just post public notifications on the internet that wouldn't cost anything other than the time taken by the staff. He already has that information. He knows when toxic pesticides, fumigants, and fungicides have been issued, and there's no reason that the public here should not have that information. We need transparency. We're in the salad bowl of the world up to six to eight billion dollars worth of ag industry going on and it's commonplace that they're using several pesticides several fumigants and fungicides in combination and that no one knows not at the local level not at the state level have they given a decent answer as to what that mix does to the public and so we should have access to that information granted not everyone will read it or understand the information but put it out there so that we can understand what is being applied near us and how it may affect our public health. As a teacher, I see so many cases of asthma, allergies, um, much worse, it goes down the line. So we need to address our public health and I'd like you to hold them accountable. Thank you. I'm gonna go see if there's anybody else in room. See nobody coming forward. I have one more hand up, Brent Sepulveda. Brent, we're gonna Unmute, you give the ability to share a two-minute public comment with this board. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, my name is Brent Sepulveda, and um, I'm on the board of the American Red Cross. I wanted to thank the Board of Supervisors for all you do for this county. During this critical time of emergency with the fires and people losing their homes, I personally wanted to thank Carl Holm, Josh Bowling, Brian Biggs, and the staff of the building and planning department for coming together to expedite the access of the Red Barn and Aromas for the direct use of the American Red Cross to distribute emergency supplies to our county and Santa Cruz County. We've helped so many people working around the clock at the Red Cross. I also wanted to say thank you to Supervisor Phillips for all that he has done to help facilitate um, this in the uh, time of need that we went through. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your comment. I have another speaker in room. Um, Co-president of the Salinas Monterey County Homeless Union, as well as running for Salinas Mayor. Um, I'm calling, I guess, today about homeless. Uh, you know, it is cool that, that we're getting new, we're possibly going into uh, negotiations for a new building uh, for the, the hotel um, and the, the the new shelter on the east side is supposed to be completed soon. Um, but what are we gonna do for everybody that doesn't make it in one of these places? Um, I think the policies are really easy to get at. Uh, you know, stopping the sweeps is a central factor in that. You know, um, just allowing people permission to be somewhere. That is gonna be, I think, the, the key of, of saving money and uh, improving quality of life and uh, you know, allowing people to exist is, is probably the cheapest thing we can do. Uh, so I'd, I'd encourage the county, if you really wanna be leaders, 
to work with the city to stop the sweeps, to um, have more uh, surgical removal rather than just a blanket discrimination dismissal, because that's basically what it is. It's open discrimination. Um, you know, we can talk about racism. We can talk about all these isms, and uh, homeless definitely have them all. Um, you know, we can name any demographic, and that is in the homeless population itself. And I think it's just rejectionism is is another ism, you know, that, that we're too used to. It's, it's not cost effective to do it the way we're doing it, though, and it's very mean spirited. Uh, and people get paid way too much to be so mean. And we have a capacity not to be abusive, but authoritative. And that's what we need to be doing. Thank you, Mr. White. At this point, we're going to close public comment and go ahead and start with our 1030 scheduled matters. Uh, Mr. Chulos. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. We have three um, responses to civil grand jury report from this past year. And first of all, we'd like to thank the civil grand jury for their uh, volunteering their time and, and efforts to look at various governmental operations. It's a valuable service. And I don't know that there are any of the civil grand jury members that are watching today, but if there are, we would like to thank them. Uh, <clears throat> the first item, <clears throat> and these are three separate agenda items, item 11 on your agenda is a response from the Agricultural Commissioner regarding the grand jury report enhancing public access to pesticide use information. And I believe Henry Gonzalez is on the Zoom and, and can speak briefly to his response. And then we have two other items after that. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lopez, members of the board, Mr. McKee, Mr. Gerard. Uh, my name is Henry Gonzalez. Uh, I, I serve as Agricultural Commissioner for the County of Monterey. So I'm gonna be brief in my uh, in my sharing of the my responses to the the findings and the and the recommendations of the of the uh, civil grand jury, I also want to thank them very much for their service, for their interest in agriculture, for their interest in the work of the agricultural commissioner's office, and for the uh, the very respectful uh, tone that they took uh, during our our interview. I very much appreciate that. So the, uh, the, the finding number one, is there a prevalent and genuine need for residents of Monterey County and other interest groups to have access to unbiased, scientifically reviewed information about pesticides? And my response to this is that we agree that there is a genuine need for residents of Monterey County and other interested groups to have access to unbiased, scientifically reviewed information about pesticides. Where we do not agree is that there is a prevalent need. We can agree that there is a genuine need, but not a prevalent need, at least based on what was presented in the civil grand jury's report. There was not sufficient information to support their assertion. So uh, we do not agree that there is a prevalent need uh, throughout the county. Finding number two, the scope of the Monterey County Act Commissioner's mission, resources and outreach capabilities mean that it can play a central role as a forum for fact-based and authoritative information to the public about pesticide related facts and issues. With this finding, our office agrees in part with the finding. We agree that the Monterey County Act Commissioner's mission means that it can play a central role as a forum for fact-based and authoritative information to the public about pesticide-related facts and issues. We disagree that the Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office possesses the resources and outreach capabilities to create and maintain a forum for fact-based authoritative information uh, to the public about pesticide-related facts and issues. Finding number three, Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office currently uses social media such as Facebook, 
but has not availed itself of the ever expanding range of other outreach opportunities, including other social media outlets. Also underutilize our print me printed bilingual English Spanish materials that could reach a wider range of Monterey of counties of uh, different communities. So our response is that we agree in part with the finding. We agree that the Monterey County Agricultural Commissioner's Office uses social media such as Facebook. We do not agree that the Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office has not availed itself of an ever expanding range of, of other outreach opportunities, including other social medias. Um, we have, in addition to the Facebook, which uh, we only started a Facebook page within the past year. And we also only started a, a, a quarterly newsletter within the past year. Uh, we have considered Twitter, uh, but we feel that at the, at, the, at the current time, we do not have sufficient uh, bandwidth, as it were, uh, resources to expand to, to Twitter. Uh, as is, we, we struggle at times to keep up with all of our legal mandates and all of the uh, requests and demands of the, uh, the public. With regards to the recommendations, recommendation number one, within budget limitations and personnel constraints, Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office should create a simple accessible forum on their website that is general public focus and that publicizes relevant pesticide information directly to the Monterey County community. This website should be bilingual in content, English and Spanish. So with, with regards to this recommendation, uh, we believe this recommendation is not warranted because the Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office already has a website and a Facebook page that are simple accessible forums that are general public focus and publicize relevant pesticide information directly to Monterey County uh, community members. Also, that website is bilingual already. It's already English and Spanish and many other languages depending on the selection of the language uh, that's on the webpage up in the upper right hand corner. There's a language selection feature that will translate our site into uh, many, many different languages. In addition to that, we have Spanish language and also Mixteco and Triqui language uh, videos uh, as well. Recommendation number two, Monterey County Act Commissioner's Office should expand its use of social media to a more varied range of portals, outlets, media, and platforms. These outlets should link to the proposed general public pesticide forum when active and also publicize Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office rich resources of pesticide information throughout. This expanded outreach should include printed materials and bilingual English Spanish content. This should be completed within one year. Our response is that uh, this recommendation is not warranted because the Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office already has a website and a Facebook page that are simple, accessible forums that are general public focused and publicize relevant pesticide information directly to Monterey County uh, community. Uh, that's, that website and our Facebook are also in English and Spanish. And again, many languages depending on language selection on the website. Uh, recommendation number three, Monterey County Act Commissioner's Office should prepare its current social media and all expanded outreach channels to support contingency planning and public notification for any incidents under Monterey County Act Commissioner's Office pur purview that might develop or create public interest or concern. It should also be done within one year. Uh, with regards to this recommendation, we believe this recommendation is not warranted because the Monterey County Ag Commissioner's Office is part of the Monterey County Office of Emergency Services and has adopted a continuity of operations plan that already supports contingency planning and public uh, notifications. Uh, our plan uh, is designed to provide timely direction, control, and coordination to the Monterey County leadership and other critical customers before during and after an event or upon notification of a credible threat. 
uh, our plan was last updated March 19th of this year. So those are the responses. There's additional information in the in what we submitted along with the board report. There's an expanded um, response. Uh, and, and at this point, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that there may be. Questions from board members. Okay, seeing no hands up, we'll go ahead. Oh, there we go, Supervisor Parker. Um, yeah, I was hesitated because actually I don't, um, I don't really have uh, questions. I have more comments. So maybe I'll wait till we hear from others. Okay. Seeing no other hands up on the board side, we'll go to public comment. And I'll see if I've got anybody in room first. Okay, then we'll go to the Zoom. I see Kathleen and Woody. We'll give you the ability to unmute yourself, share a two minute public comment with this board. Okay, and I do want to point out before you start the clock, we have two people here who close we both want to comment. Um, my uh, recommendation, recommendation to the board for what you have on your agenda is to say yes to A and no to B. We agree with the recommendations of the grand jury report. Uh, we do not agree with the, the agricultural commissioner's critique of those recommendations. Um, if you look at the composition of the grand jury, you can see, uh, I think, that uh, Mr. Gonzalez conflates these recommendations with advocacy groups like Safe Ag, Safe Schools, of which I am a member, which represents uh, people in Monterey County. And that is not the case. We only found out about this grand jury report yesterday evening. Uh, it did not come from us. Uh, so obviously the grand jury, which is mostly people from Monterey uh, and South, uh, if they are concerned, there must be a prevailing need for this information because people who are the neighbors of the fields, people, the teachers and the farm workers, those people were not really uh, represented in the composition of this report, which was more aimed toward con consumer concerns. So uh, the, the recommendations are really very mild. Uh, last night, I spent some time on the website. It is not user friendly. It's very difficult to navigate. Many of the links are either not working or missing. Uh, just as an example, the um, recently added, added stuff about COVID was there, but um, in terms of local uh, concerns, there's not a word about the smoke and the fires. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of the emergency response, I could find no evidence of what the county agricultural commissioner's role is on that emergency response. If you uh, shop around on the website and go down to a distant corner, you can find it says pesticide emergency, call 911. That is not a viable link for their participation. So Thank there you, are Kathleen. quite your, a few your defects. Two minutes are up, Kathleen. Is, there, is Woody there? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'm Woody Rehanek, uh, Safe Ag, Safe Schools. Uh, I did go to the Monterey County Ag Commissioner's website last night again to review it. And one thing I noticed is that for restricted materials, the uh, notification of intent to apply those, which gives who, what, where, when, and even why, and also maps of the intended application, that these can be done online now. now we at Safe Ag, Safe Schools, as well as millions of people in the state of California believe that we have a right to know uh, when we uh, restricted materials, which require special training, special permits, and should uh, have special notice. We have a right to know in advance when before these are applied in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in our farms and ranches adjoining senior neighborhoods as well as homeschooling and so on. So our bottom line is that this right to know could be implemented by posting online and making public, not privatized information, privileged information, but public information, making public the notices of intent to apply restricted materials. Then any stakeholders, any people interested could access that information in their neighborhoods, including the aerial maps, and make sense of 
the restricted pesticides that are going to be applied in their neighborhoods. Then as we are with COVID and smoke uh, issues and so on, people can advance plan how they would take shelter or respond to those pesticide application events. So this is something that could be uh, an expansion of what, what is already being done with the online uh, application where the ranchers you, and Woody. farmers are doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your public comment. We're going to go to Horacio Mesquita next. Horacio, you have uh, two minutes to share a public comment with this board. Horacio? Hear me? Yes, barely. Can you speak up a little bit? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to comment that uh, it's very necessary that uh, the Agriculture Commissioner can develop a way of informing the public when pesticides are, especially restricted pesticides, when they're going to be applied. Because, uh, as you know, you have been here in San Gerardo uh, a few times, many times. Also, uh, Supervisor Alejo, you know, we uh, we never been informed when restricted materials are being applied. Uh, sometimes the growers, when they used to have uh, strawberries, they they came and tell us that they were going to fumigate. And that was good, you know, the, the members and the residents can defend themselves, at least locking up their, their windows, closing them and protect themselves inside their homes. But when pesticides, when restricted pesticides are applied, we never been informed. And I think uh, we need to uh, keep the public safe. Um, and this is just a matter of finding a way of informing the public so they can protect themselves from pesticides that are dangerous to the, the health of the resident. So I, um, I just wanna tell you that uh, it, it will be uh, good for the residents of Monterey County, and especially for communities that are close to the fields uh, that at least uh, have a way of uh, informing them uh, when restricted materials are going to be uh, sprayed so they can defend themselves, protect themselves from those uh, pesticides. Um, thank you, so Horacio. I, thank you. We appreciate your comments. We're going to go to Hector next. Hector, give you the ability to meet yourself. Yes, hello. My name is Hector Calderon, and I'm the organizer for Be Safe Ag Safe Schools. Um, yeah, I'm calling it because today the, you know, the board will be approving these responses that the civil grand jury report had submitted and, you know, clearly this is an opportunity for the county to, to really act and address the findings in the 2019-2020 Monterey County civil grand jury report that uh, Henry had, you know, reported on before this and as, you know, SAS's coalition, um, we, we, you know, how Kathleen and Woody had already mentioned it is a, that we disagree with how the Ag Commissioner has really responded to these particular recommendations in the report and its findings. And so, um, as we all kind of already know that it's a, it's a really prevalent need that we have public right to know when we are being exposed to these pesticides as Horacio has already mentioned, as well as knowing that the pesticides are a broad critical public health concern with you know, knowing that there have been hundreds of news articles and TV spots that have been focusing on the Monterey Bay area um, in the last few years. And so as a part of SAS, we are really asking the board of, um, to really direct the Ag Commissioner to address the gaps in information in our county that highlight are highlighted in the report by taking really two easy steps that we could really strengthen the public's health actions in the county by one, really expanding the successful already farming safely near schools pilot project, which really addresses the concerns of the uh, grand jury report to include all schools, um, not only just the North County 
schools that are already just 10 schools currently, but it also include all of the pesticides classified as material uh, restricted materials. And as well as um, the second step would be just to kind of have the county work on expanding on the expansion of that, that pilot project would be to immediately use low cost and low resource steps that the commissioner can do to post the notices of intent, which are the NOIs that use that are, that are used for restricted materials and pesticides on the ag um, in ag. And so those could be something that the ag commissioner can really post on his website. Um, and growers already sort of requ are required to submit these NOIs for restricted materials, pesticides. And so the ag commissioner has like the approval and denials and, and really just being able to provide those resources on his website would be a really easy step for him to really have transparency and clarity about what his office is doing and what growers are just really spraying in the area. So I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. We're going to go to Sarai Martinez next. Sarai. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Sarai Martinez. Uh, I'm also with the Safe Eye Safe Schools Coalition, but I'm also a resident of Monterey County, daughter of uh, farm workers. And um, I appreciate something that Chairman, you uh, stated earlier about how information keeps us safe. We have said, we have witnessed this with the fires. We witnessed this with COVID um, and yet with pesticides, we lack information. Uh, the grand jury report enhancing public access to pesticide use information as an opportunity for the agriculture commissioner's office it's, it really highlights what we've been saying for a long time, that the public has the right to know. This report really looked at the, uh, you know, the website and the information available and really find out that the current information is really targeted and most useful to growers and also to, agricult to agriculture professionals. What is in the website is not for the public to know when they're exposed to pesticides. And what we know also recently that um, the pesticide illness report from the, from the Department of Pesticide Regulation is that Monterey County is the second highest in the state from uh, reported pesticide illness. Uh, and this, this cannot happen and that uh, the fact that our farm worker and our farm worker communities are exposed to all these risks and we can't really protect us from you know, climate disasters, but we can protect ourselves from pesticides. And I really urge the board to really look at and be the leader in the state. Uh, we work with the California for Pesticide Reform Coalition across the state. And we really want Monterey County to lead in making sure that you know, the public has this right to know. We cannot let government pick and choose what information they provide. We should have this information. And it's a public health concerns. So for that reason, we're asking the board to really direct the county agriculture commissioner to expand the website, um, the Farming Safely Near Schools to all schools in the county and Thank not only you, Sarai. Thank you, Sarai, for your comment. We appreciate your public comment. We're gonna to go to Cesar Lara next. Cesar. Good uh, afternoon, um, members of the Board of Supervisors. Cesar Lara with the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council uh, and also a board member of uh, California for Pesticide Reform and um, would like to remind the board that this is the Board of Supervisors response to the grand jury. Um, and it's great to hear from your staff, the Ag Commissioner uh, response to it, but this, this uh, response is supposed to be a reflection of the board. And so um, it's clear that there is issues in the departments in regards to transparency and who is the constituent that they work for. And uh, as a department in the county of Monterey, uh, we encourage you to really hear my colleagues. And uh, as we asked for transparency, we were um, kind of surprised and encouraged by this uh, civil grand jury uh, report. Just, you know, just heard about it when the, when the agenda went out from the Board of Supervisors here and want to encourage the Board of Supervisors to really reflect back and take the recommendation from your Act Commissioner, but also uh, look at the experience that we've had in the community around transparency around pesticides. Uh, it's been an issue, not just for our current generation, but the generation before. And this um, Board of Supervisors, you all could really set the tone going forward and 
respond and direct your act commissioner to be more transparent to the community. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Cesar. With that, that wraps our public comment, and I'll bring it back to the board. There's a hand that shot up afterwards. Um, Mr. Martinez, I'm going to go ahead and give you two minutes. That'll be my last public comment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I, I do want to thank Henry and you guys for, for taking a look at what's possible. Uh, I would like to suggest as a cost-saving measure, a cost-saving measure, uh, and that is that uh, it'd be easy to make it possible that out of one location at commissioner's office, the information go out to the Office of Education who would then put it out to every school district. Now, any school district that can see where the potential applicant, applicator uh, or uh, applications will be done, they can get the heads up. Instead of having, what, 32, 33 school districts trying to find out on their own and have 32 staff members research it, it should come from one, go out to everybody, and from there, they could react and do the best what's in their interest for their ADA, for the health and safety of their students, and for the public in general. That would also help keep down any potential lawsuits and, and uh, unwelcome bad press to our, our ag industry and to the investors that we have, i.e. the businesses and everybody else. Because it would be sad to see that uh, the world will find out that our, our, our products are contaminated or not taking care of properly. I know there's a lot of work being done on the health and safety of the workers and the quality of the product that comes out of here. I think we can lead the world by doing one more thing and that's to let the workers and their students, their kids know that there's potential hazard being, being applied, heads up, and thereby bring down the cost that it takes all of us taxpayers to pay. Because when someone, a farm worker gets sick, most of them are undocumented. They have no benefits. They go to the emergency room. And I'm talking about a whole crew of people or individually, and it costs the taxpayers. So we are subsidizing this, this issue. And I think that we can do better as a whole. And I encourage uh, Henry to take a look at that, Mr. Gonzalez to take a look at that. And, and uh, uh, look at, there's plenty of students out there that can figure this out. Thank it doesn't you, Mr. Martinez. We're over two minutes. We appreciate your public comment. Thank you so much. At this point, I'm going to uh, got another hand. Okay, any hands? If you're going to speak, please do me a favor, put your hand up. I'm trying to manage time here, and I keep getting surprise hands. So if you're going to speak, please raise your hand now. I'm going to go to Carol, Carol's iPhone. No. Carol, you have the ability to unmute yourself, share a two-minute public yep. comment with this board. Just done. Carol Erickson, also a member of SAS, since it's uh, founding as Safe Strawberries, Monterey County. Um, I agree completely with what your, my predecessors on the group have said, but I wanted to suggest for the uh, Ag Commissioner's Office that there is a forward function on your computers. With one push of that button, you can contact as has been suggested in Monterey County, the Office of Ed, who can contact all their schools. You can contact city halls. You can contact local fire departments and police departments as to where the location of the intended um, spraying is planned. Uh, maybe contacting the Board of Supervisors so that they are aware that there might be a problem. That the TV, the radio know and the Monterey County Office of Emergency Services. Don't let this be a surprise and then have to bring all the red lights and sirens coming to the place, panicked parents running around, teachers trying to protect their children. Do it in advance. Use the forward function on your Ag Commission computers. Thank you. Thank you very much. So closing public comment, bringing it back to the board. Uh, I'm gonna see if I have any board comments. Okay, I have Supervisor Parker first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I um, uh, kind of along the lines of uh, one of the public speakers who said that this is the Board of Supervisors response. 
Um, I appreciate that the ag commissioner, um, uh, you know, has to deal with this, uh, these issues uh, quite often and probably is exasperated. Um, but I, I'm just concerned that the responses that we have here so far, um, they sound like hair splitting, they're contradictory. Um, they say we can't do it, but oh, but by the way, we've already done it. Um, you know, I think um, the, I, I think the, you know, it's, it's okay for the Ag Commissioner to say, um, I have mandated duties and my budget really only allows me to do those things. There doesn't have to be a lot of defensiveness or back and forth. And I have to say, when I re read this response, it sounded very defensive to me. And I don't think as the Board of Supervisors or as the Ag Commissioner, we need to be particularly defensive. So I'd really like to see a, a rewrite uh, of this um, so that it can, uh, if my colleagues agree, that there, there might be a kind of a different tone. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that we try to do in our responses is to appreciate the issues that the civil grand jury uh, has brought up. Um, and they're really talking about uh, public information. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we're all about. Um, the other thing as a little theme, um, I know that taking on more communication and outreach, even social media, you know, it's, I, I think a, a sort of a statement that we could make is, um, you know, we have Facebook, we have a web page, um, but maybe we can learn from the COVID um, situation, uh, some more tools to use on outreach or um, social media and, you know, work with IT. Um, they know how to do this stuff. And um, I think some things could be fairly easy um, to do. I'm not the expert, but I think being open to the, to the feedback and if, if there really are budget constraints to just say so, um, you know, that's, that's okay. But I do think that some of the suggestions uh, from the public um, could also be looked at as um, ways to um, uh, actually respond um, in action to what the grand jury um, brings up. So um, anyway, I just, I don't know if that's, um, well, I want to hear from my colleagues to see if you all um, agree that there's a little bit different um, a tone that maybe we can um, incorporate into into this response. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. I commend the civil grand jury for their work on this report, as I do on every report. Um, their their uh, time and their public service is, is valued, and it's a, it's a lot of hard work that goes into these uh, reports that come to us. So I, I do I take that. Uh, this work with uh, a lot of respect, but I, I did want to point out, you know, as a former uh, a a staff attorney for California Rural Legal Assistance, somebody who started my career dealing with these issues, uh, 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 representing workers in the fields or, or um, perhaps issues um, with pesticides around schools. Uh, this goes way back to my early beginnings of my career, but I have to say that in my my um, years in, in 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 law and in uh, politics. I have to really, uh, being one of the supervisors, work closely with their Ag Commissioner's office, especially during this pandemic, I have to commend this office. I mean, this Ag Commissioner's office is probably the best in California, a true leader um, in many different ways, um, looking out for the community. Uh, an Ag Commissioner, first of all, who comes from the community and was a farm worker himself to now being the first Latino Ag Commissioner and, and, um, and providing my observations and my critical eye um, I would say his, his office and his staff have gone, have gone above and beyond the call of duty during a time of crisis. And some of the programs that we have in Monterey County, we are the leaders. It's not, we have to be the leaders. These programs don't exist anywhere else in the state of California. And, and some of these actions require support or action at the state level. Um, we, Monterey County has led, but if they're not, the state is not gonna provide an extension of grants so that this office could continue to do work. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a limitation. 
but the state has the resources if it wanted to is to do more, but it has not. But even with the limited funds that um, resources that our office has, I have to say they've done exceptional um, from dealing with uh, masks to, to farm workers uh, and having our schools that are part, that have participated in this pilot program, the only one in the entire state, I must repeat. Um, I have to say that they've done, done, done a lot of good work. And so um, and it's, it's in these moments when, when we could um, 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 take our hats off to our, our ad commissioner and say, thanks for doing the good, keep it going, you know, um, and, and some of these reports, they provide recommendations. Sometimes there's a difference of opinions. Often, very often when the board does a response, that, that, that it doesn't mean that we agree on everything, but we do uh, uh, res um, respect the, the independent eye, the, the feedback and recommendations being made. Um, I get that. But I, at, at this moment, I, I, I feel good with, with the Ag Commissioner's response, and I want to be supportive of him because I, I said I, I work closely with them, and we've been able to do a lot of model efforts um, um, coming out of his office. And I think um, the other Ag Commissioner's office, even those surrounding our county, should be following suit um, um, to the work that uh, him and his staff have, have accomplished over the last several months, especially. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Supervisor Phillips next. Supervisor Phillips. Well, I, I, I hate to be uh, always agreeing with uh, Supervisor Parker, it seems, uh, but, but um, a couple of things. I, I did, as was mentioned, this isn't just um, the Ag Commissioner's response. It's basically our response. I, I do think Ag Commissioner's doing a, a great job, uh, but the response was a little defensive, uh, and I'm not sure it's the response uh, I I would uh, uh, institute if I was in there. I respect the grand jury. I worked with them for years um, uh, uh, when they actually worked on criminal indictments uh, and grand jury indictments. Uh, I think they do some great things. I'm pointing out uh, some things that need to be addressed in government. Uh, sometimes they're, I agree totally. Sometimes I don't. I uh, kind of mixed bag on, on this one, but uh, I, I, it's not uh, of, of the responses we're making to the grand jury. This one uh, didn't impress me as much as the other ones. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm going to go to Supervisor Adams next. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank the Ag Commissioner as well. He has a very difficult job and I appreciate his, his, uh, his comments, uh, the, the, the scope of the comments. Um, one of the things that I was happy that he said that there is a genuine guarantee, a need for residents of Monterey County and other interested groups to have access to unbiased scientifically reviewed information about pesticides. I don't think anyone could argue with that. But having, um, having served on the grand jury myself, I understand the amount of work, focus, time, and absolute energy that goes into doing the kind of work that the grand jurors have done on this report. And I, I just really want to thank them because it is their, uh, their volunteer time to review the county's functioning, whether uh, good, bad, or ugly. And um, I have to agree with, my, uh, with Supervisor Phillips and with Supervisor Parker as well that with that lens of knowing that it's their volunteer work that has, has been done, I, I just think we should look at all of the responses from all of the various departments because I wanna sh make sure that these responses show civility and respect. I appreciate very much uh, the Ag Commissioner's comments at the beginning of his report, speaking very highly of the interaction that he had with the, uh, the, volu the, the grand jurors when they came to um, to interview him, I'm, I'm, I did not miss those comments. I thought it was very, uh, very gracious of the commissioner to say those things. But unfortunately, when they were translated onto paper, it did not seem to come across that way. And I, and I agree. I, I feel like it probably was uh, sounded a bit defensive. And uh, to supervise to what Supervisor Alejo said, I don't think there's really any reason for our um, uh, ag commissioner to be defensive. He's really been very instrumental in putting together some new programs that many other um, uh, ag commissioners have not done. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. But more to the point, I think as we, re to recommendation to all of the staff, um, when you consider the grand jury's report, it should be looked upon as an opportunity to receive constructive feedback 
and to respect the community's input um, to make improvements on how we serve the public. Because the truth of the matter is, we are employed by the public. We are empo employed by the public to serve them. And they certainly deserve our respect. And I uh, want to ensure that all of the responses that we have and the interactions that we have with the public uh, have at their core the respect that is uh, absolutely due them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Adams. You know, I, I concur with Supervisor Alejo's assessment of the performance of our Ag Commissioner through this crisis and the compounding crises that were the fires and COVID and everything else we've dealt with this year. Um, and I, I understand the concerns about tone, but I think for me, the, the bulk of, of content was good in terms of the material in there. I know that being, being the, the representative of the vast majority of the Salinas Valley, I know so much about who has responsibility where, how are schools notified, what are those triggers, who gets those notifications, what are those buffers and distances, all that's set by the state. You know, and, and really, I think piecemealing it county by county, I, we've always said even with a lot of other issues, isn't the right way to go on major issues like this. I think it's the responsibility of the state who has that oversight with DPR and all those agencies to set those notifications and everything else, which they've done, and recently as well, holding meetings in our Salinas Valley to help create those rules. And so I, I, I share... I share a lot of the concerns about tone, but I do think that the content was good and it's just about approach and that's sort of where I'm sitting at this point, but I do want to be clear that I wholly support the, uh, the uh, work that our Ag Commissioner's Office does because I know they've been stretched quite a bit this year and have accomplished a lot. Uh, and so I want to respect everything that they've been able to do to protect uh, the farm workers and ev everything we do in this valley, even though it's going to be an incredibly tough end of season here uh, with all the continued impacts. And so with that, I'll open it up for any action by this board on the recommendation from staff. Of our response prepared by Act Commissioner's Office. I miss, we missed the front end of that, Supervisor Alejo. I would say I'd approve uh, staff's recommended response and uh, rec um, move it for approval. I'll second it and we'll see if we have any, we'll see where that goes. Can we go ahead and get a roll call vote, please? Supervisor Alejo. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. No. Supervisor Parker. No. Supervisor Adams. No. And Chair Supervisor Lopez. Yes. So the motion fails three, two, we have to respond, right, by law. So, uh, Mr. Chulos, in terms of time frame, can you share with us what is, what's the potential here? The, the response deadline is the 25th of September, so if the board wishes to take action and have something brought back, it could be brought back next Tuesday. We have time reserved in your morning agenda for that. Mr. So Chair, I'll go, I'll go ahead and make a motion that uh, the, uh, the Ag Commissioner uh, work with the CAO's office to um, reflect the good work of the Ag Commissioner and um, respond in a, a more respectful and gracious way to the civil grand jury. And I think I made a couple of suggestions and I think other board members have as well. Um, but I think um, to my way of thinking, the uh, so that's the motion. And then a comment is that I think even if the Ag Commissioner doesn't have an obligation for transparency and communication with the public on some of these things that people ask for, um, the county does. Um, and I also think that the grand jury's um, uh, findings and recommendations were mild, they were respectful, um, and they really um, reflect a, um, an agricultural county where there is a widespread interest in um, 
health and safety as it relates to um, uh, pesticides. So, um, and so I think um, there is a way to acknowledge the good work of the Ag Commissioner um, and to uh, acknowledge some of the suggestions that the, um, the uh, grand jury uh, are making. And um, so, and I think uh, working with the CAO's office, I remember several years back, uh, we, we had, um, it used to be more of a habit of uh, more departments to have very terse, um, not really responsive responses. Um, and it took a while, but we have gotten much better at really providing information and responding uh, well. And I think um, it's, it's challenging to do uh, because uh, sometimes it feels personal, um, but uh, this is, uh, you know, this is part of our uh, public and civic life. And I think um, the CAO's office has a fair amount of experience with um, uh, really finding that uh, middle ground um, so I hope that uh, we can see something next week that um, really does uh, reflect what the grand jury was getting at um, and also um, the strengths and the limitations of the, um, of the Ag Commissioner's office. And I would just say uh, as a, just a little detail that uh, referring to the fact that COVID-19 has presented challenges and means we can't do this work, um, it seems like COVID-19 is here forever, but it isn't. So I think um, really just talking about the, the other realities of the constraints, um, I think is, is sufficient. And even COVID might be, a, we may have learned some things about how to contact people more effectively. Um, you know, as a county, um, we've been doing a lot uh, in terms of social media and all kinds of um, avenues to communicate with the public. So that may be something that's available to us uh, in this response as well. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Parker. So that's a motion, right? <laughs> yes, the short part at the beginning about the Ag Commissioner right. uh, working okay. with the uh, CAO's with office CAO. to bring back up um, a response for the board. Okay, so we've got a motion. I'm happy to second that motion. Okay, so I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Alejo? No. Supervisor Phillips? Aye. Supervisor Parker? Aye. Supervisor Adams? Aye. And Chair Supervisor Lopez? A reluctant aye. Thank you. So the motion carries and we will move forward. And at this point, it is nearly 12.30, so I'd like to break for lunch and give us a half hour. We will pick up right where we left off at 1 o'clock. Again, we will be here at 1 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>